Magandang tanghali po sa kanilang lahat, uh, sa lahat po ng nanonood, everybody viewing and uh, joining us from all over the world. Nakikita ka agad natin sa chat box natin. People are watching from all over the Philippines and some people coming in from other countries. Thank you for joining us today to learn more about the impact of technology giants in amplifying or, or in limiting information flow, most especially during elections. As the official campaign period for candidates for the House of Representatives and other elective posts for regional, provincial, city, and municipal officials begin in a couple of weeks, on March 25 to be exact. And given, of course, the national elections that we are already deep into, how sure are we that the voters will be getting the messages that they need to make an informed decision at the polls? Welcome po sa ating lahat to the eighth installment of the National Forum on Communication and Democracy Philippine Elections 2022. Title po ng ating pag-uusapan ngayon, Eleksyon, Taming the Tech Titans. Ako po si Robbie Alampay, I'm a journalist with TV5, Signal TV, and Puma Podcast. And I'll be your host and moderator for today's program, which you may also view via live streaming on YouTube and Facebook at the TVUP channel, um, and also the Philippines Communication Society Facebook page. We will also have some live tweeting, so please use the hashtag uh, PCS Forum Series. That's capital PCS Forum Series. Now, before we begin, uh, we'd like to acknowledge the organizations that have made this uh, program possible. We'd like to thank the University of the Philippine System, the Office of the Vice President for Public Affairs, the Philippines Communication Society, the UP Information Technology Development Center, or ITDC, of course, TVUP, the Internet Television Network of the University of the Philippines, and everyone who helped to make this forum series possible. And because we have many faculty and students watching us today, PCS members will be receiving a certificate of attendance as a benefit for their PCS membership. Now, if you have not yet applied for or renewed your membership yet, this is your chance to be part of the premier organization that represents the communication discipline to the Philippine Social Science Council. The online membership form is available on the PCS website. You should be seeing that on your screens right now. philcomsoc.org, philcomsoc.org slash membership. And of course, because this is a national forum on communication and democracy, we want to make sure that everyone, all of you, have an opportunity to be heard. Will be using Mentimeter, no? So if you're you if you've tried this before, you already know how it works. If not, uh, kita nyo, on your screen. There's a QR code. Bring out your smartphones. Uh, take a shot of that uh, QR code. Take note of the code three eight three six five four six nine. If you want to join via your laptop, you can just go straight to menti.com enter the code, and then you will be part of our discussions. We encourage everyone to participate. We will be flashing questions later on. And get your sentiments to these questions. You will, your answers will then be part of our discussions. We'll be including that as well. Maybe prompt some questions to the panel discussion later. And you'll also see how everybody else listening in are watching. By the way, if you, you can watch again, as we said, you can watch over YouTube, you can watch over Facebook, and some of you have registered direct into this uh, into this webinar. Um, okay, just take note of those that number again for Menti for our Menti code 3836-5469 or 3836-5469. Okay, so I think we're ready uh, to set the tone of election taming the tech titans, let's hear a few words from an applied linguist who has pioneered forensic linguistics research in the Philippines. She is a regular lecturer at the Philippine Judicial Academy or FILJA, the professional development arm of the Supreme Court of the Philippines. 
She's a member of the Technical Committee for English of the Commission on Higher Education. She's a member of the Board of Trustees of the Foundation for Upgrading the Standard of Education and a past president of the Linguistic Society of the Philippines and the Philippine Association of Language Teaching. She's currently a professor and the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Letters at the Pontifical and Royal University of Santo Tomas. Everybody, please join me in welcoming Dr. Marilu Madronio. Thank you very much, Roby, for that very kind introduction. Good afternoon to everyone. I am happy to open this webinar titled Keeping in Check, The Power of Technology Giants, sponsored by the Philippine Communication Society. What makes it more meaningful and relevant is the fact that it is part of a series entitled National Forum on Communication and Democracy, Philippine Elections 2022. I read an article a few years ago that featured an interview with Farhad Manju, who writes a column, State of the Art, which explores the latest technology ideas shaping the future. And he mentioned about the big technology-based companies, Apple, Amazon, Google, Facebook, and Microsoft as being the frightful five. Manju states that these five giants make up half of the top 10 valuable companies on the US stock market and which collectively influence everything else that happens in technology, as well as the rest of the global economy. But why did he describe them as frightful? Manju thinks that because these are very big global companies, they wittingly or unwittingly can influence government decision-making and people's choices anywhere in the world, including the latter's exercise to choose their political leaders. And because of their sheer size and reach, practically all important aspects of human life today are associated with these companies. Facebook, for instance, also owns Instagram and WhatsApp. FB alone reaches at least 2 billion people every month. Google, on the other hand, is used every day by people communicating with each other through email, accessing its search engine, and referencing its Google Maps, while being associated with YouTube at the same time. Amazon owns different kinds of media and publishing properties, and also has audiobooks in Audible, and even shoes through Zappos. A most interesting question relating to Filipinos at this time is, Will these companies have any impact on local and national elections in the Philippines this 2022? So using the words of Farhad Manju, who writes about technology for the New York Times, these big five should do a lot of fact-checking as part of their responsibility to society. Little or no checking allows unscrupulous parties to spend disinformation, to spread disinformation or fake news through the facilities of these companies. As such, according to Manju, more efforts should be done by, say, Facebook in terms of fact-checking, even if it has partnered with fact-checking companies. Facebook could be in some way the arbiter for what's right and wrong in Facebook to address the growing fake news problem. Indeed, while these big companies help us in more ways than one by making our daily lives convenient, we should also be wary about the disadvantages that they can bring. A few months from now, we shall be holding our elections where the use of information and communications technologies will play a crucial part. In many countries around the world, new technologies have been introduced to aid the electoral process. We can only hope that amidst the pandemic, e-voting can be used in casting our votes and even counting them. Certainly, this mode of election is new to us, but it can increase the participation of many citizens, especially those who work abroad and those who have physical disabilities. E-voting could be a relevant option when mass gatherings are discouraged, such as during times of pandemics. Of course, these are 
serious risks and threats also that can possibly compromise the integrity of election results, especially when we consider the fact that we do not have experience using it. So it is always best to invest in institutional proactive interventions to be able to keep pace with the advantages of, the, of technological changes. Before I end, I wish to thank Dr. Gina Lumawi, Board Director of PCS and the project head of this webinar for her kind invitation for me to open this event, to Dr. Rika Abad for facilitating everything, Dr. Peña, Dr. Alfonso for the warm welcome, and of course, my warmest congratulations to the Philippines Communication Society for conducting this series titled National Forum on Communication and Democracy, Philippine Elections 22. Thank you very much to one and all, and may you all enjoy the lectures organized for you today. Maraming maraming salamat. Maraming salamat po, uh, Dean Marilu Madruño of the University of Santo Tomas. All right, it's time for our mini quiz. You remember, Kanina, we encouraged you to um, join us on Mentimeter. You may, you if you join us, if you registered, no, uh, you can already see a couple of questions there. We'd like to know what you think. If you haven't joined us yet, go to menti.com, enter the code 3836. 5469 and you can join in what we're, what we're doing right now. Uh, so if you're there, you're seeing on your screens, first the question, ano ang kapangyarihan ng tech giants sa darating na eleksyon? What power do the tech giants have in the coming elections? Now, for this question, you may put in up to three words for the word cloud. You will also see that the words are Increasing in size, the more times it is mentioned, the more times na meron kayo kaparehong iniisip, the bigger the text that you'll be seeing in your screen. Ayan, we already in fact see some answers already coming in. So we'll leave the Mentimeter poll open for you as we go along with the program. Mamaya, re-reveal natin kung ano ang sinasagot nyo. Uh, there's also a second question. Sa tingin nyo ba, may influensya ang big tech? sa iyong pagpili kung sino ang iboboto sa darating na eleksyon. Do you think that big technology has any influence on who you will vote for or how you will vote in the coming election? So again, you're seeing it, you're seeing it there. Um, okay, so whether you're watching us directly through this webinar or you're joining us via Facebook or YouTube, you can participate. You can join, go to menti.com, register, enter new code number, and you can answer this. Now, as we continue to hear from our viewers, let's now hear uh, the word on the street with a, some person on the street interview with TVUP. Sobrang laki yung role na ginagampanan ng social media sa paghubog ng narrative ng election natin ng uh, ngayon. Kasi marami po silang tao na uh, ma-reach, kumbaga malaki po yung audience nila. Useful ang social media to share information about the candidate, no ano ang kanyang mga platforms, ano ang kanyang background, ano ang kanyang maiaambag sa ating bansa. Actually, sobrang laki ng influence ng mga tech giants na ito. No? We're not only talking about dito sa Philippines, maging sa ibang bansa or globally, di ba? Kumbaga, nasa tech giants ang uh, malaking bulto ng responsibility sa pagkitil ng false information or pag pagmaintain ng accurate at honest information. Tech giants sila, so marami sil maraming naniniwala sa kanila. Kung bagat isa silang um, verified na social media or account. Kung bagat para lalo na sa ibang tao, tingin nila is credible na agad kapag ganon po. Sa tlawak ng reach nila ng power nila, um, dapat may merong system in place. Kung magagawa ma nila ng, ng sistema, yung, yung platform na ma-filter out yung mga, mga fake news or magkaroon ng mga fact checks sa, sa platform. At ma-protect din po yung mga verified accounts ng mga totoong nagbibigay ng, ng informasyon. So, dapat mapaayos pa nila yung pagsasala ng ganong klaseng mga 
um, accounts. Maging open-minded po tayong lahat sa bawat candidate. Uh, wag tayong mag, wag tayong umidolo ng iisang tao lang. Pakinggan po natin silang lahat. Maging mapanuri tayo sa nababasa, napapanood, naririnig natin sa iba't ibang uh, forma ng media. Uh, para sa mga botante, bumoto tayo ng tama. Okay, maraming salamat TVUP for giving us the some sense of the pulse of the people to uh, these persons of the street interviews. Um, we'll be having a panel discussion, but just a quick, you know, because some of our panelists may not have understood um, everything um, na, na, that was mentioned kanina. But obviously, um, our people and these young people that we interviewed in the interview ng TVUP, they see the power, they see the benefits of social media. They also recognize the things that, uh, that I mean, the unknowns that, that scare us. Uh, we don't know exactly the algorithms that go into what we see and what we consume. We don't know how exactly we get to see what we see. They're also um, afraid of the, the, their sense that there's nobody vetting the information that's going out there. So that's a big question as well for them. And some suggestions as well that maybe the platforms themselves should be investing in the process of vetting. But I'm sure some questions there about surrendering that power to the platforms that they're concerned about. We'll have a, a conversation about this. We'll get into a roundtable discussion with some experts that we have uh, invited. But just a reminder to everyone, if you're if you're signed up here, dito sa webinar natin, you can leave your questions and comments direct on the Q&A, uh, uh, via the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your screens. Um, but if you're watching over Facebook and YouTube, what you can also do is just leave your comments and questions in the comments section. And we have facilitators who will try to get those questions back here to us, dito sa backstage into our webinar. Okay. So let's get into the discussion uh, here, not only to talk about what uh, Dr. Madruño um, uh, discussed earlier in her keynote uh, address, but also in the things that we've heard from people and that we will be hearing from everyone. Um, let me introduce our distinguished panel of experts for our roundtable discussion. Uh, so we're talking about election, taming the tech titans. We're very privileged to have with us this morning a marketer with broad experience in integrated and loyalty and CRM marketing, branding, and event management on a regional scale. He is currently the politics and government outreach head in the Asia Pacific of Meta. Of course, we know Meta as Facebook, that is now the uh, mother company, the main organization of Facebook. We refer to it as Facebook. We'll probably be using that interchangeably in the course of this discussion. Um, but anyway, uh, Roy Tan is head of out politics and government outreach for Asia Pacific for Meta or Facebook, where that means basically he's responsible for working with governments and politicians on how best to use Facebook, Instagram, Messenger, WhatsApp to connect with their constituents. It's all welcome, Roy Tan. And next, we will, along with uh, Roy, we'll also have with us assistant professor, an assistant professor with the Department of Communication Research at the College of Mass Communications of UP Diliman. Her research centers on the mediation of platforms, algorithms, and digital technologies in cultural production, politics, and public discourse. Presently, she is co-lead of the Digital Pulse, uh, Digital Public Pulse, rather. That's an interdisciplinary big data research that examines the networks, conversations, and interactions of users online about or related to the 2022 Philippine general elections. We will have with us Professor Marie, Marie Fatima Gao. And then rounding up the panel, we will also have, we're very pleased to have with us a faculty member of the Department of Communication Research at the College of Mass Communication, again with UPD Liman, he uses quantitative and digital research methods to study how network and environments shape the communication of political and scientific information. Uh, let's all welcome John Benedict uh, Bunkin, Professor Bunkin. 
Okay, so let's dive straight into it. I, I do want to bring in Roy Tan just so everybody knows. Uh, Roy is a uh, is Singaporean. He's based in uh, he is based in uh, Singapore. This is also why uh, we'll try as much as possible to to speak in in English. But Roy is pretty used also to working with a lot of people who slip in and out of uh, of Taglish, I'm sure. Uh, so I I want to throw this first question to Roy by way of prompting our conversation. Uh, Roy, the title of this of this series of this particular episode of this particular conversation is "Taming the Tech Titans." How do you feel? I mean, people are are acknowledging the benefits, the power, um, the change, the positive change that social media brings. But we start off with a title that you know they, they, it's pretty loaded. Not to mention <laughs> what Dr. Madruño mentioned about the frightening or the frightful five how does that how does that feel not just to you but to the to the industry um, when people frame discussions around you as needing to tame the tech giants thanks Robbie and thanks thanks for um, introducing me uh, and hello to everyone on the on the VC today uh, look it's it's a good question how do I feel look uh, I think it's it's a good question, right? I mean, it's it means people are critical about uh, you know large corporations like Meta, and uh, it's good to be critical because when you're critical, it means you are questioning your sources, you're questioning the content that you see, um, and especially coming up to the Philippine elections, that's exactly what we want people to be, right? To be critical, um, and it keeps us on our toes as well. So I think. You know, I mean, I don't need to kind of go through a list of, of all the things that, you know, Meta has been through the past few years, but mm. um, it does keep us on our toes. It keeps us um, wanting to do better and needing to do better. And um, so I think it's a very valid question. I think it's a, it's a very good question. Um, and um, yeah, I, I guess we will discuss more about the various things that we could be doing. Yeah. I mean, Dr. I, I, Professor Gao and Professor uh, Bumkin, where do you think that's coming from? <laughs> the, I mean, even the title, if we imagine the, 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 the brainstorming and the conversations around organizing this, why do we settle on the word taming the tech giants to start with? Okay, maybe I can start. Uh, am I clear with my audio? Okay. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I think we have to still think about why they're called giants to begin with. You know, it's the political and economic power they have that transcend boundaries of nations. In fact, you know, there are a lot of metaphors used about Facebook, about YouTube, that, you know, the, their economic um, uh, power is more than, you know, a, a nation state uh, already. And, and because of their global reach, um, th their influence is really beyond um, um, the expanse of the U.S. or wherever else um, they are prominent. So I actually don't think, you know, when you think about taming, it's as if the giants are gentle. That's, that's you know, the assumption there. I don't think they're gentle. They're actually quite aggressive because, you know, they are protecting their bottom line. Um, at the end of the day, they are corporations and we have to think about them as uh, entities with, you know, commercial interests. And even if, you know, these platforms have become spaces for political engagement, ultimately, it's still, you know, commercial in nature. So I think we have to think about the tension that the platforms are trying to balance. And in that balancing act, what is, you know, sacrifice or compromise? Mm. Professor Bunkin? Right. Um, just to add, you know, with Professor Fatima's inputs, um, again, problematizing the size and the scale of these, you know, big tech corporations or in they've practically monopolized you know, the digital infrastructure that we use in our uh, in our contemporary life. Um, and I guess the word taming is a bit, um, I guess it can be appropriate given the fact that there were instances in the past, uh, in the past we're in, you know, um, that uh, there's some sort of control over the kind of information that we get. Um, and uh, again, there were documented cases where in, you know, um, uh, there were some, uh, I guess, you know, uh, abuses um, when it comes to, you know, um, in terms of manipulation, perhaps, so with the kind of information ecosystem that we have. Um, so it, it, in that aspect, you know, the, the, the word aiming uh, can be uh, uh, quite appropriate you know, in, in, uh, in, in this uh, forum. Mm. Hey, Roy, I, uh, I, I want to bring in a, a couple of, I, I want to unbundle a couple of words uh, that uh, that 
um, Professor Fatima and Professor Benedict um, brought up. Um, control over the information, manipulation of information, or maybe at least the algorithms that, that define. Maybe you could qualify that for us. Right? From the perspective of, of somebody inside the industry, is that, are those fair terms? Is it, is it control? Um, and for that matter, I mean, what's a fair word? I know manipulation can be quite, I know, but at the same time, we know where that's coming also uh, from an academic standpoint. You, you, but the, the algorithms can be tweaked. You can target and you can try to, uh, uh, try to engage, uh, raise engagements. But how, how, what terms would you use if there are any, uh, if there's any problems with the terms of control and manipulation of information that, that you can vet or you can control that we get to see? Well, I think, yeah, I mean, I think control is, is too strong a word. Um, look, I mean, first of all, the, the goal of newsfeed is to show people the things that they care for, that they want to see um, and, and they're interested in, right? So if, if I like sport, uh, I'm going to engage a lot more sport content and I may see a lot more sporting posts in my newsfeed. Um, and, and that's the idea, right? You know, we want to ensure that people have a, you know, a, a pleasant experience on our platform and, and they see the things they want to see and um, uh, you know, we don't serve them things that they are not interested in seeing. It's, I mean, it's not too dissimilar to, to you know, other, let's say, e-commerce sites. You purchase something and you know, they give you suggestions mm -hmm. of what you may want to purchase after that, right? Um, I think, but having said that, I think it's also important to, to note that we also realize that that could also be a, you know, a, a double-edged sword in that sense. You know, we, we do realize that we need to ensure that we have policies in place to, uh, you know, ensure that what you want to see is also within the means of what you should be seeing, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to see terrorism content, we're not, we're not going to serve that to you. Um, and so we do have policies to ensure that, you know, those things, um, you know, are, are not on our platform and, and uh, you know, we continue to iterate and, and include uh, on, on the policies. It's, it's, ever, it's ever changing, it's ever being updated. I think that's, that's one thing key. But also I think, you know, people don't understand that it's not just, you know, it, it, they need to look at it, step back and, and, and basically look at the bigger picture as well, right? The, the whole ecosystem of persons on the internet is not just uh, normal users, but, you know, a lot of businesses, uh, you know, NGO CSOs also use the platform and, and they are also speaking to certain target groups of audience. So for example, you know, like a small, small uh, medium business uh, in the Philippines, you know, they're using the algorithm to target people that would like their products, that would want to, to see their products. And so, um, you know, all that also comes into play. So there's a bit of factors to really think about there. Um, I wouldn't say it's control, but it's also showing people what they want to see. But it's also important for people to take a step back and look at a, you know, the holistic picture of the different um, stakeholders you know, that are using the platform. Uh, and, and, and so, yeah, I, I guess that's a very easy, like top line way of kind of you know, answering that question. Yeah, and, and certainly we understand that there, there are gray areas here. Uh, and, and Dr. Gao, you know, one, one problem, of course, is that when it all started, that's really how we saw it, right? I mean, and that's how people appreciated it, to be, to be fair. Uh, this is a platform that now gives us actively, proactively gives us what, what we need. I'll get into later the question of how the platforms figure out what, what we need um, even before we do. Uh, but I, I, I wanna talk about that, that. The problem is over the past years, it's not that, we realize that there's so much gray area uh, between, as, as Ron put it, what we want to see and our realization that there are things we shouldn't necessarily see just because we want it. And it's one thing to talk about sports. It's one thing to talk about food. But once you start talking about ideology, once you start talking about um, even ideas or politics, that I mean, without even having to go all the way to the extreme of terrorism, there's a lot of there's a lot of let's say minefields or things we didn't necessarily uh, think through that could actually be uh, potentially harmful or dangerous. Could you talk about um, that, I mean, uh, Dr. Gao, 
and maybe also Dr. Uh, Umkin about that gray area between the two extremes of simple benign things that we do want to see and the extreme things that even subconsciously mm -hmm. we want to see, but we shouldn't. But there's a whole range of areas in between that we really haven't thought through. Right. So um, I'm going to go into a very specific law in the U.S. called Section 230. So it essentially um, removes the accountability um, from platforms, from being accountable for the content that circulates um, in, in, their, in their website or in, in, their, in their space. So the fact is that platforms uh, were pressured to do content moderation only in the past years, not necessarily in their you know, origin. Um, because for them, they're just a vessel. They're just a space where you know, content from people, from businesses, from politicians uh, can, can circulate and can be distributed. Um, so that's the first thing I want to emphasize. They don't have you know, a legal a responsibility technically as long as that Section 230 policy is in place. Now, because of the pressure to content to moderate content, and they have developed policies. And Royce, right? It's a you know, it's a growing list. Um, there's you know a, a joke that Facebook's content moderation policy is just a page before, um, and then it's just growing and growing because we discover more of these problematic or you know questionable, suspicious content circulating in the platform. I think it's realistic to say that you know we cannot expect the platforms to govern all of these because it's mm. just too much. And you know, platforms do two types of um, moderation: the algorithmic. Quality there's an automated tagging of content. There's the human moderators as well. Of course, there's labor issues involved in that as well because you know they're outsourcing those kinds of um, work as well. But uh, going back to, to my point, um, you can't expect platforms to moderate all of that. At the same time, um, that's already a, a concession we can you know uh, uh, move past. One of the things that is quite uh, problematic also is the platform's definition of what is objectionable in the first place. Of course, they want to uphold you know freedom of speech. Um, of course, protected there are protected speech that are you know um, encouraged in the platform. That's why the cultures in the platforms are quite rich because of that you know free exchange of discourse and information. Definitely want to celebrate that, but. At some point, there's also, you know, some generosity in how they define, for example, this information. If a uh, content doesn't really violate a particular content moderation policy, then they don't really want to, you know, take it down. So what I'm saying is it's too, you know, it's too narrow the, the way they define what's objectionable. Um uh, to the point that there are a lot of borderline content that might be equally harmful too, but you know that gets past the moderation um, uh, filters of, of the platform. So it's, I'm not talking about Facebook alone, but also YouTube and other bigger um, platforms out there. It's it's that you know the, the articulation of the policies are quite narrow to capture the you know gray and 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 you know sophisticated forms of this information nowadays. Okay, uh, Professor Bukin, any thoughts? Right. Maybe I can just uh, make a comment on, you know, how platforms really um, are shaping the way we view reality. It was mentioned that, yeah, it, it, they do provide us, you know, with the kind of information that we want, right? It's really based on, you know, our, our characteristics, the way we behave online. And, you know, all of these algorithms are shaping, um, are really just providing, you know, the, the kind of information that they think um, would be palatable for us or think that we, that we would be accepting. But um, I guess um, from from a platform perspective, that's you know that's uh, it keeps the uh, system you know running. You no, know, um, it keeps the people engaged. You no, know, but um, I guess from an information um, you know perspective, you know, mm. it sort of also homogenizes the kind of information that we're seeing. We're seeing more mm. of the same things, more of the same kind of you know of of ideologies, for example, or beliefs. You no, know, then it sort of you know uh, it cultivates uh, you know a more homogenous view of reality that may not be reflective of what's out there. So in essence, that's another um, area. I Think that the platforms can also be you know um working on not just on facebook but on twitter and then you know and, and youtube you no know? um it's that uh opening of spaces for more diverse um exposure for more mm. um you know for lessening of more extreme beliefs you no know? <laughs> and it's providing us with that diverse mm. again uh more heterogeneous view of, of reality it was one of my, in one of my research studies on the networks of the filipino youth i found that you know when when the youth is exposed to more diverse information they tend to become more politically knowledgeable and politically participative um and i guess these are you know um areas that and, and aspects of you know of socialization that that platforms can can also like contribute 
Mm. And to that point of, the, of, of you know, encouraging diversity also, diversity in content, diversity in thinking, diversity in, in, in knowledge, I want, I want to get into just one basic question and a basic understanding of, again, the power of, of uh, tech titans over us right now. And that's the power of knowledge. Uh, I want to throw this to everyone uh, so that we can have a perspective from academic and research standpoint and also from inside. But in all honesty, how much do, uh, you know, when, when we try to feed as well as we try to encourage diversity, that starts from a base of understanding the users, diba? How much do platforms actually know about, not just about us, but about what we think? Um, I, there's this old, I don't know if it's a joke, but I take it as really partly true that the platforms know me better than I know myself. How, how true is that? Anyone can start. Um, I, I can start. Um, I think that's a popular knowledge, no? Because the platforms are the data owners who are co-sharing data with us. And it's not just the data they collect in their platform. They're actually, you know, buying out data from other platforms out there, creating your know, data brokerage systems that allow for the platforms to connect a lot of information about us. So there's this concept called algorithmic identity. So they have their own, you know, if, if I know myself now, Fatima, they have a Fatima version in the back end of, of their, you know, systems um, that algorithmically is created based on those, you know, multiplicity of data points. So definitely the platforms know uh, a lot about us, but those uh, data points that they know are only constructed for the metrics that matter to them. So the, the Fatima identity in the back end is actually for the commercial interest um, only. It doesn't really care about the political, or maybe it does practical, they care about their political interest if that's profitable for them. So let's think about that in you know economic terms. So definitely they're powerful in that sense because of the surveillance systems around digital economy. And, and admittedly, digital economy actually is anchored in that idea of surveillance. You know, it, it is, in fact, there's a term called surveillance capitalism. It's the new form of currency, right? Um, so I think on, on that level, um, they know uh, a lot about us. But the next question is that how do they use that information, that knowledge about us to engage us at the same time profit of us? Yeah, I think um, I think it's important also to, to, to kind of dispel that a bit because it, it's not about us or, or Meta knowing more about you, but it's about, do you know the platform? Be, because, I mean, I think it's, it's, very, it's very important to know that there are lots of settings uh, on, on Facebook and Instagram that effectively allows you to clear the history, uh, allows you to choose the ads that you want to see. Um, and there's a lot of different settings uh, in our platform that removes you know, what we know about you. So I think it's more about how can you educate yourself about the platforms that you engage in. Uh, at least, at least from Meta's point of view, that that there is a lot of tools that we allow you to, to do that. I, I can't speak for the rest. Um, I, I, so that's that's one, and um, I think it's also important to to understand also that uh, earlier on, you know, speaking about you know being very narrow about our enforcement, I think it's important that the more blur you get about enforcement, um, the more inconsistent you you enforce, and the more inconsistent you enforce. Um, you know, then the more issues that you have, right? Because if you're inconsistent about enforcement, then what is right and what is wrong? Um, so I think that's also a thought process um, to think about as well. Uh, because at the end of the day, you know, when, when you work, when we work at scale to review um, content on a platform, it's not as simple as, as you know, understanding you know, um, the blur lines, because the blur lines sometimes can go either way. And without, without being the arbiter of truth, you're not able to kind of determine that mm -hmm. those blur lines. And, um, you know, I think, you know, for a company like us to, to kind of dictate what should and shouldn't be done uh, on some of these blur lines, it's, 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 it's not a good thing, right? You don't want any corporate company to do that. And that's why, mm -hmm. you know, we do, uh, you know, we do, talk to, to, to governments, we do appreciate that there should be regulation, there should be proper 
uh, laws on, on certain, you know, uh, topical issues regarding uh, content, right? But I think a lot of governments out there, they're, they're not at that stage of understanding even how to use the platform or how the platform works to really understand how to kind of legislate, you know, because at the same time, you also don't want a government, and there are mm -hmm. governments out there that are legislating um, or, or having laws out there that basically, you know, quells or, or curtails free speech at the end of the day, right? It's, it's the government's point of view uh, and not your point of view. So I think that's, that, there needs to be a balance and, and it's the world that I think Facebook or Meta plays in right now. And mm -hmm. um, it is not an easy, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know it, it's not easy to navigate. You know, there are lots of blurred lines that we want to try to narrow down and make it clear. Because if it isn't clear for us, then how is it clear for you? And how does it benefit the user at the end of the day? So um, the lots of this, you know, at least I, from my personal point of view um, and my personal experience, at least being, being a meta, and I've been involved in a lot of discussions of policies relating to the Philippines, relating to a lot of countries in, in APAC, never once has there been a consideration about the bottom line. Right, I've never even heard any conversation saying, if we do this, it's going to be bad for the bottom line. Right? It's more like, is this good for the for the people? Is it good, you know, is it good for the country? You know, should we be doing this? And then what are the considerations? Can we actually enforce on it, you know, consistently and properly uh, and to the best of our abilities? Uh, because sometimes it's not black and white. Uh, and I think that's that's yeah, but uh, that's important to kind of understand. Um, so at least that's from my personal experience. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I mean to be to be again to remind everybody of the context here, why we have Roy here. Uh, Roy is head for engagement, basically with with pol uh, pol politics, policy, and governments. Uh, so there is really that engagement. I imagine that would also include uh, civil society as well and and the private sector. Uh, so that that point is is well taken, but. Uh, I, I'd like to push a, a bit more on, on, on the point of uh, the question of who then becomes uh, the arbiter of truth. Because even when you, you listen to the man on the street interviews earlier, I think we swing too fast into saying then, you know, well, let's give that responsibility to the platforms, make the platforms responsible as well for, for being arbiters of truth and making sure, but we know there's a slippery slope there as well. You would take Russia as an example uh, right now, where content is being censored and both and on the legal front as well. They double down on both the law and the platforms can can crack down on content there. So you don't want you don't necessarily want to go down that that path as well. I uh, Benedict and Fatima, what about that? I mean, do we necessarily want to make the platforms the arbiter of truth? Uh, quote unquote, and what's the what's the what's the downside there? Um, maybe not in absolute terms, you know, but I think there has to be some sort of responsibility on the end of the platforms as well. Um, I mm. think right now, of course, uh, Facebook and Twitter and YouTube are recognizing their you know their roles in all of these things, you know, in in the proliferation of fake news, in you know, the spread of misinformation, disinformation, and right now there are great you know. Um, uh, developments when it comes to, you know, the crackdown of, of fake accounts and then even, you know, um, trying to get to be one step ahead in terms of, you know, preventing the spread of new ones and the creation of, of fake, uh, you know, false accounts. Um, so definitely, um, I think it starts with that, you know, uh, platforms are realized, uh, uh, well, they, they have realized it already, but, you know, um, having that responsibility and recognizing that responsibility in terms of you know uh, the the role in the information ecosystem, um, in 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 you know as academics, you have a term you know that uh, we call them social technical actors. So they're not just you know they're not just uh, vessels of information, but they also have an active role in you know in uh, or they have the agency and the capacity to filter information, and that includes false information information as well. So I guess uh, that's my answer to that. It's not like a hard you know they, they should be so arbitrary of this but the, uh, the the roles that they play you know in uh in the uh, truth in this uh, contemporary information environment that we have that they play a big big role in in, in that aspect mm -hmm. just to add um to ben's point um we don't want them to be you know the sole gatekeeper but they are so big that they are have become the default gatekeeper right so in fact 
you know, I was thinking, you know, that um, these big tech companies have been shocked. You know, we're just a tech company. We're not a media company. We don't have editorial decisions. Mm-hmm. We don't have, you know, um, uh, news values in place to see what to prioritize, right? Like like media organizations. But, you know, there's a lot of debate around uh, that, that, you know, should they be just tech companies and, and forego that editorial mm-hmm. um, responsibility? I think by default, they have to because uh, they're already doing so through the algorithms because you know why are algorithms in place to begin with there are you know billions of you know content out there and the space in our news feed or in our you know uh in our platform that we consume is just finite right so the algorithms are there to sort um everything else so i think the platforms are understandably understandably you know mobilizing all these you know technology algorithms and whatnot to make our experience better in the platform that's you know part of their you know design um, but at the same time one of the things that I think is concerning um, is uh, how the platforms have become uh, so big um, that they're not you know they're evading accountability already and my biggest yeah. issue really as a scholar also is that whatever policy is in place to act on this information to act on trolls etc are happening in the West. Um, and because, because, you know, Meta, YouTube, Google, they're all situated in, in the U.S. Um, of course, the other developing countries like Australia or the European Union actually have, you know, power over this platform. Because if EU, for example, bans Facebook, that's, you know, a big, uh, there's a big effect uh, on their operations there. So they have, you know, the power to, to, you know, tell Facebook don't do this or, you know, implement these kinds of policy, etc. What's happening is in, in the developing side of the world where, you know, there, I would argue, you know, it's worse here in terms of your disinformation crisis. It's not addressed. And, and there's a lot of conversation about, you know, Facebook only, um, not just Facebook, but, you know, Google as well, responding to, hmm. you know, the U.S. senators, for example, when they have an inquiry. But if the problem's in, in the developing side of the world, then that's something easier to neglect. Even if the Filipinos, a Filipino nation is actually one of the, you know, most active social media users in the world. Hmm. So there's that discrepancy. So one of the things I wish for the platforms to do, and I think they're already doing that um, to a certain extent, is to you know, develop, you know, dictionaries for local languages to make their content moderation more effective, you know, having local representatives here. Facebook has, uh, Facebook Philippines has an office here just a few years back. So they're starting that aspect too. But I think um, the engagement could be better. Sometimes they come in too late um, and, 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 you know, damage is done. Uh, so I think there are things to improve. But definitely, you know, still the, the locus of power is in the West. Uh, we'll, we'll talk, I want to get into that uh, discussion about regulation, right? because when, when it started, lo- we, we all celebrate every new platform that allows people to speak up. When YouTube came and Google came and Facebook came, really, everybody thought, oh, this is a great equalizer, even for small candidates, small businesses, small people with small voices. Everybody gets that platform. And then very quickly, over one decade, we also see the excesses. Not just of, not necessarily of the platform, but even of our people. I get your point, Roy. That that's what user um, user and user agreements are for. It's also to remind us of our responsibility. The point about our personal responsibility is well taken. I speak for my own personal um, experience. I don't. I just click agree, right? And you can change that, and that can be ten pages long now. And I just click agree. And the thing is, that's by fault. But the platforms also know this. I guess the question is, to the point of uh, Professor Bokin and Professor Gao, let's still talk about responsibility, of everybody's responsibility, notwithstanding my own irresponsibility or my own recklessness. What are the platform's responsibility to protect me from myself? Yeah, no, so I, I think that's a good question. And, um, and look, it, it's not as simple as just clicking agree because it's, uh, you know, I totally get you everyone clicks agree and doesn't read the T's and C's. So I'm not talking about T's and C's or anything like that, but there are, there are features that, like if you go to your settings or just before settings, there's like privacy control, privacy checkup. So these are things that we have that make it easier for people to identify as, as soon as they go to the settings option. And what we're doing, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a multifaceted approach. You know, what we're doing uh, a lot of in the Philippines already um, is actually a lot of digital literacy uh, outreach and engagement. Right, so working with both government as well as uh, uh, NGOs and CSOs, 
um, to try to push out a lot more of, of this knowledge of how to use our platforms. So, you know, a couple of years ago, we, we launched Digital Tayo. It's our basically our flagship digital literacy program in the Philippines. And, uh, you know, we continue to iterate on that. I think most recently we've added new modules on, on civic education. We have rolled that out with the uh, dip ad before in, in Philippines. Um, you know, coming to this elections, we're also working with, uh, you know, with, with uh, I think the legal network um, for truthful elections, uh, Lente, and to try to promote some of these, um, you know, uh, digital literacy uh, efforts, as well as Comelec. You know, we have actually launched a campaign um, to, to, you know, get people to really think before you share and to kind of, you know, look and, and look at your sources and, and you know, be, be inquisitive about the things that you see. Yeah. And so we, we totally get that. Yes, it's not just, hey, this is the app, happy, you go and use it. So we, we are you know, um, looking into how we can spread the word a bit more to ensure that people um, know how to use the platform. Right. And, and on top of that, you know, uh, you know, we're also working on, on supporting uh, Internews in, in the Philippines uh, to launch uh, a fact checker incubator because we also want more fact checkers in the Philippines. Right. To, to increase the capacity of what can be fact checked and also the, the, the standard and, and the variety of what can be fact checked in the Philippines. So, you know, there's, there's a lot that we're, we're trying to do to kind of uh, increase education, increase, um, you know, better uh, availability of information on the platform as well uh, in the Philippines. And all that is not just in the lead up to the, to the elections. We've actually done some of this work for the past two, two three years already. Um, so it's not, it's not just like last minute, you know, we're rushing to get things done. Um, so yeah, so I think th these are just some of the things that I, I'm mentioning. Yeah. But we're also doing a lot of work with journalists as well. Um, so incubators to kind of upskill them um, to make sure that they're better in informed uh, uh, tags on our platform for for news. Um, so, I mean, those are just some of the, the things that uh, that we have done. Yeah, but I, I, speaking as a journalist, one problem is when you talk about training journalists and even for that matter, training fact checkers, you're still addressing it on the level of, of content, right? And what we're finding is that the problem is not a content, the real challenge is still reach. So even when you fact check something, the fact check will never catch up, not even to 10% of the original fake news that went viral. Um, so it, I, I will still bring it back to the question of what is the responsibility and what's the capacity? Maybe I'll frame it this way also. We know that one of the extreme examples and dangers that have, represent, that have been demonstrated by this question and this concern is precisely elections in other countries, in our own country and so on. Most notorious, of course, United States, uh, when people talk about very openly now, I and mean, forensics have borne this out, Russia meddling in the politics, not hacking the systems, but as they put it, hacking the voters. Because they know so much about the voters and they know so much about how to game the platforms. What are the lessons learned that technology platforms will acknowledge and accept? What changes have been have taken effect at the level of the platforms, at the level yeah, of your yeah. algorithms. So, I mean, of course, what I, I mentioned earlier, a lot of what ex externally we're doing, um, you know, I think, like I mentioned before, this whole effort is a multifaceted approach. So I spoke about the external um, parts of it. Uh, look, internally, you know, we, we do a lot uh, of backend stuff that that may not always be, be announced. Uh, I think maybe I'll mention some of those that's been announced, so at least to give you an idea. Uh, so things like targeting options, right? You know, in terms of how people can target ads uh, uh, for you, you know, uh, uh, earlier, um, well, last year, we have actually announced the removal of certain targeting options like um, sexual orientation, like uh, social or like social and political beliefs um, and, and causes and figures. So, you know, that effectively removes a lot of targeting options of what, of how people target you know, misinformation to, to, to users on our ad. So that's, that's one thing that we have done. Um, you know, we have also started to include a lot more or update our policies, um, especially for, for public figures, uh, political candidates, uh, you know, involved in, let's say, you know, content which are sexualizing them or, or derogatory, uh, uh, you know, sexualized Photoshop images of them, uh, degrading uh, images of them. And these are, these are now, uh, you know, 
newly put into our policies since the end of last year, um, where you know for certain things we get reports off and, and we take down for certain things they're proactive work. Uh, that we, we, we do. So, uh, you know, for example, there's a lot of proactive work that goes on to um, child exploitation in the Philippines, right? Uh, and, and, you know, we, we do proactive monitoring. Uh, and, and similarly, there are certain um, keywords, I would say, uh, that we monitor in the Philippines, not just child exploitation, but, you know, other, other things surrounding, you know, what's happening in the Philippines to look at and, and to see if we can remove you know, uh, content. So there's a lot more um, signals. There's a lot more, uh, you know, teams in the, in the company looking at, you know, how we can proactively take down uh, content in the Philippines before they're even, you know, served up uh, to the platform. And so, um, I mean, that continues to, to, to be done. Uh, there's also things like uh, our, our takedowns of, you know, coordinated inauthentic behavior. Uh, hmm. which we have done in the past in the Philippines, we continue to do, uh, and hopefully you'll see more uh, in the lead up to the elections. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, this, the, those are just some of the things that, that we have announced and that we're doing. Um, but yes, there's a lot of back-end work that, that we're doing to try to improve, um, hmm. I guess, the, the experience online. Uh, speaking, on, yeah. On the, uh, on the platform. And speaking of the back-end, I, I, I'll bring in again uh, the, the professors. Uh, to weigh in, but I do have a follow-up question, and we're already seeing this in the comments. A lot of questions about algorithm. I mean, how far have we gotten in 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 making the algorithms of the tech platforms more transparent and therefore more accountable? Well, uh, I mean, if you that that we have actually announced generally how the the algorithm works. Uh, there was, if I'm correct, towards the end of last year as well, we, we actually posted quite clearly the signals that we look at and how, you know, how we actually determine things should be ranked. And, and that has been, that's actually available in our newsroom. And I, I know press covered it here and there. Uh, but ultimately, at the end of the day, um, is that we can't exactly also showcase the whole, you know, how to exactly, you know, the technical ways of how the algorithm works, right? Because then bad actors uh, can use that to, to yeah, yeah. Uh, you, know, you know, curtail whatever we're doing to, to stop them. So, um, so yes, we have actually announced that and, and that, that's actually, uh, you know, I don't have the link here, sorry, I, I can try to find it and put it in the chat, but, uh, but yes, we have that, yeah. Yeah, Prof? Okay, um, so uh, my, my field of study is in algorithmic um, research. And I think we know for a fact that during the whistleblower, you know, account uh, an interview of Frances Haugen in the U.S., we know that there's a civil integrity committee within Facebook um, that uh, implements um, algorithmic breaks or, you know, tweaks in the algorithm to, to ensure that during elections, at least, you know, they, they try to surface more credible resources like news and, and from, you know, um, social institutions. There's that. But the thing is, they turn it off after the elections. And from what we learned from our study, you know, the election now has been happening years ago. After 2016, all these other candidates are already seeding their ecosystem of, of content out there. So apart from the algorithm um, um, there uh, that, you know, is, is being turned off, at least the safeguards uh, are being turned off after elections, where democracy is still, you know, happening. Um, it's not just elections, right? Um, there's also the factor of the algorithm incentivizing hyper-partisan content. Is this happening across the platform? Hyper-partisan con 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 content are actually those, you know, scandalous, controversial. They're, they're the clickbaity type of content that really works and go viral on these platforms. So there's that issue of, you know, the, the, the algorithmic uh, incentives uh, with, with the economic model of Facebook incentivizing this kind of content in the first place. And the thing is, I know Roy mentioned about when the politicians are already made accountable for their content, but from our study, we see that it's really the intermediaries or yung mga tagapamagitan in Filipino of, of the candidates uh, using you know, other Facebook pages, other Facebook mm. groups that campaign for them. And, and that's where the gap 
um, is 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 uh, where, that's where the gap is in terms of regulation. You know, you can police the official, the, the check mark account of the candidate, but not the you know people working for them. And the thing is, you can never know who's working for them and who's you know community organized because the lines mm. are blurred also. So um, I know this 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 um, talk is about you know tech titans, but at the same time, I think we have to call for the industry that you know powers the disinformation ecosystem to begin with. Perhaps you know Facebook. Google, etc., can actually not only create, you know, media literacy campaign or create more rig- rigorous content policy moderation, but also try to investigate, you know, the the, the insidious um, campaign yeah. uh, industry that support um, all these propagandic work. I, I want to bring in Professor Bunkin and maybe Professor Bunkin, pakusapan na kita to continue to lead us into this conversation now directly of what does this all mean for the current elections. And the current political climate that we have, but I want to go back I, for a quick question, lang to to Roy. Uh, Roy, when you say that uh, Facebook, for example, you 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 do engage with government, you do engage with the Comelec uh, right now. What are the topics that you you discuss in terms of how to make the elections more? I mean, and protect the integrity, um, the fairness, and the truthfulness of the elections. What are some things that you you talk about on the level of and and the, on the level also of what government is asking uh, of you? Well, I think one of the key things was um, transparency of of advertising, right? Um, mm-hmm. And and that's that's the reason why uh, you know we continue to allow political ads uh, on a platform and be transparent about it. So if you don't already know that um, if you place any political ads or ads on elections. Uh, in the Philippines, you have to get yourself authorized. Um, and what this means is that you have to be based in the Philippines, get yourself authorized um, with a proper address. And then after that, when you place such ads on a platform, you need to ensure that you are posting, uh, you know, uh, who's paying for such ads. And all these ads go into what we call an ad library. So if you just search or Google Facebook ad library, you'll find it. And um, and all that is is up there, uh, transparent for everyone to see for the next seven years in the archive. What's a political ad? So any ad that uh, that a politician places uh, that mentions a political candidate, a politician, um, those should be uh, you know um, captured into. No, the, I mean to, to yeah. point to the point of uh, Professor Gao, for example, if yeah. I'm not part of the official campaign and yeah. I'm a private group, whether or not you believe. That I am yeah, but if you are campaigning for a politician, if you're campaigning for a party, if you're pe- campaigning for a group, even though you're not part of that group, it's considered a political ad. Okay. So it doesn't matter who you are. Um, if you are placing such ads, you'll, you'll have to get yourself authorized uh-huh. and all these will go. So it's, it's transparent for all to see, that's my point. Okay. And, and, um, and quickly to make, a, to make it just a clear, an ad here by definition is something that you paid for. Yes, increase correct. The reach and, and the boost. This is different from people's I and mean, people watching in your individual endorsements that does not right. count as an ad. so this is Once one of the things that we, have, that we have been speaking to them about and and that's the reason why you know i guess we continue to to allow people to place ads because um yeah you know it, it, we found it of value and 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 you know they wanted us to be transparent about it and and so we are yeah okay professor bunkin what does this all mean for for the current uh, climate and and the the conduct of, uh, of the campaigns and the elections Right. Um, well, definitely, you know, um, uh, for politicians or, or for, for, you know, for political communicators or well-versed you know, in the, how these algorithms can work, you know, they can potentially make use of this and, you know, um, uh, you know in some instances manipulate this you know, in whatever way they can, the, the strategic use essentially of these platforms and their algorithms. It's something that, that we're seeing right now you know, in, in our um, social media driven you know, uh, election landscape and political campaigning landscape. Um, so um, by uh, these strategic use you know, of the products that's offered by, by big tech you know, in, in communication, you have hyper-targeted messages you know, based on individual user behavior, individual user data. Um, then there are, there are also features that are prone to manipulation such as, for example, on Twitter, you know, the trending list is something that you can um, quote unquote manipulate you know, and create some sort of bigness and grandness and then create or man- manufacture that illusion that you know there are uh, candidates are that are more popular than the others so um, again it's all of these techno technological features that uh, are uh, uh, malleable you know, and can be manipulated by by individuals who have uh, who have malicious or who have that desire really to sort of influence public opinion um, 
um, that's really the biggest implications of of, of uh, the, the role of big tech no, in, in the, the elections. Hmm. Uh, Professor uh, uh, Gao, uh, we talked about, you started to talk also about uh, regulation. Uh, what are the models that already exist from Europe to North America, maybe other parts of the world? Australia, we know, entered into this debate about, the, about content of, of news. I mean, not just uh, for helping the business models and uh, independent media to survive, but also in terms of regulating content algorithms. Are there any best practices? Is there any way to strike a balance here? Um, in, in the US, I think, I'm not sure if this is already um, implemented, uh, Roy, at least let me know if I'm correct, um, or just recommendations actually from academics. There's this what they call algorithmic break. So for example, if a content is suspicious before it even goes viral and spread in the network, there are mechanisms in place to, you know, pause, you know, hit break um, um, in, in this content's uh, virality or, you know, spread in the network. And then they, they check if it's, you know, valid or, or permissible in the platform and then they allow if it if it is it or if it violates um their community guidelines then it's taken down so because one of the biggest damage really is when a content that's false it's fact checked later on after five days and that's already you know uh moot right you know it already garnered millions of views or, or likes etc so it is it's, it, it is that preventative measure um i think we benefit a lot from policies um, abroad, especially in the EU, where they're more, you know, progressive with, with what they're trying to propose um, in terms of moderation. Uh, but definitely, we are um, following suit only with with, it, with the Western um, countries, you know, political decisions to, to govern or to, you know, tame quote unquote these tech giants. Um, in terms of, I guess, our own regulation, Royce, right? The government doesn't even know how Facebook works. Less so, in creating policies that actually um, have teeth, you know, can really actualize results. And and I think your Roy is also right. There's multifaceted, you know, solutions to this. And the first re the first level of re of really addressing this understanding how the platform works. It's good we have you know Facebook and Google offices in the Philippines, but it, it is necessary to have the conversation uh, with our Congress uh, people to have an understanding how the platform works. And we have to have a multi-sectoral approach as well. So it's not just us, yeah. but media. And I want to emphasize actually media's role in this. So there's this, you know, um, I guess uh, opposite side of things happening that at, while you know the internet and social media is growing as a source of information, news organizations are actually dwindling in terms of their media trust, you know, social trust in this institution. And and from my own research that I'll be you know sharing in a few weeks, um, there's a lot of you know pages on Facebook and YouTube as well of uh, of of actors uh, portraying themselves as news. You know, we call this to the news. They present us themselves as mm. news. They all the aesthetics of news is there, but they're not delivering news. It's not research is not vetted, and the platforms allow you know these pseudo news content to spread. And it's actually something um, that I'm studying right now. I think that's one of the basic things that they can actually act on now. Is is news as a concept? You know, protected. There should be you know um, vetted. Who can speak news or who can spread news on the platform? So I think that's one of the things we can do immediately mm. um, for the platform. Yeah, but it's a it's a kind of worms, diba? Right? You start talking yes. about that, you you get to the question of who vets, right? um, yeah. I, a Quick quick question for you just popped into my head. Does the free market of ideas work? You think, given the current technology, the current platform? I think we have to concede that the market is unequal to begin with. There's money always mm. involved. So even if Facebook, YouTube, whoever takes down these accounts, they're just going to create new ones. And they're going to hire all these, you know, um, um, people who would uh, create content, who would, you know, troll, um, you know, uh, the public on, on particular issues. So I think it's always, always going to be about the watches or the money involved in maintaining this, this information ecosystem that should be policed as well. Um, hopefully the platforms can help us, you know, um, spot them. So content, content moderation, should it be content moderation, but perhaps it's about time to call it actor moderation because the agency mm. is, is in the actors as well. Yeah, Professor Bogin, we haven't even brought up the matter of education. Although we have, we have, we have mentioned it. I'm, I'm sure. But talk about the role also of education in the long term um, here, uh, so that people are not just 
passive consumers of their own biases um, and so on. What, what else uh, should we be considering and throw in there in, in, in the entire ecosystem to, to, to understand and to intervene and hopefully find some long-term sustainable solutions to these questions? Right. Um, I think uh, Roy mentioned earlier, you know, that really the need to um, educate our publics when it comes to using the platform. Um, uh, digital literacy is playing a big role in how we engage our the content that we see online and even the way we, you know, manage our own, you know, our own social media accounts. You no. Know? Um, so it's it's I think that's the first layer. It's educating them on how to use the platform, what they can do, you know, the content that it offers, and all the you know even the algorithms, you know, that are involved in the in the the kind of content that we see, you know, in in the platform. So definitely, it's not just you know the platforms that are supposed to be working here. You no, know? it's really a multi-sectoral uh, 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 approach, you know, in solving this issue. Um, it's also a cultural thing. You no, know? it's uh, there has to be a cultural approach to this. Um, um, right mm. now, we're not you know, really open to having conversations that are outside our immediate circles or uh, that, that contradict our belief systems. So I guess it's also something that we have to uh, inculcate among, you know, our young users, you know, that uh, we should be engaging in conversations that can be difficult, you know, even if they contradict our own belief systems. Um, uh, sorry, am I still here? I think everyone. Yeah, you're, you're here. We can, we can all see you. All right. And we can all, hear you. Hmm. all right. All right, so that's uh, so that's a, a, a cultural really approach to this, and it begins with our, our different social institutions in school. So, you know, um, uh, media literacy programs can emphasize um, this need, you no, know, to uh, deliberately, you know, or consciously engage or uh, engage with with conversations that are are different you know, or that are that are opposing to our, our belief systems. Um, in in our research, we saw uh, that. Uh, Really, the communities that we form or online are really what we call porous, you know, meaning we can just get into these different communities, even if they are communities of people who believe different, uh, differently from us. You know? So, but it takes that consciousness, you know, that, that conscious decision to enter these communities to engage in these conversations for us to, you know, really benefit from the kind of diverse, um, heterogeneous content and be able to understand where others are coming from, whether it's, you know, matters of politics or, or religion or whatever belief uh, that we ha might have. Uh, let's, let's set the politics aside and the elections aside. And I want to discuss everything that we've been discussing, the problems, the power, regulation, algorithms, um, and our own personal bias in the context of something that we all intimately, personally can, can, uh, can identify with, COVID and the pandemic and disinformation uh, and anti-vaxxers and so on. I bring this up because this is one area where platforms, government, civil society, private sector, citizens, all were together in saying that it's not just a pandemic, it's an infodemic. It's something we need to in, in, uh, um, uh, intervene on. It's something that uh, we need uh, a lot of information. At the same time, there's a lot of misinformation going on out there, what are the hard lessons learned over how we've tried to manage information, misinformation, disinformation over the course of this pandemic? Roy, let me start with you. I mean, I know governments also uh, worked hard with the platforms to try to clean up this information and to actively push, um, to actively push uh, proper information so that people can take care of themselves. What were some of the interactions, at the same time, hard decisions to make in terms of regulating the platforms and, and trying to have control over good and bad information? Yeah, I mean, I think first of all was, was just ensuring, you know, who are the authoritative sources, right? You know, you had WHO, of course, you know, being one of the key authoritative sources. But as you go down to country level, like um, there were countries that, um, uh, you know, WHO was saying you don't initially you don't need to mask up, but certain countries were mandating you should mask up already. And, and you know, things like, uh, you know, some of the different treatments available, some countries were a bit more open to it and some countries weren't. And, and so having the kind of, you know, decide and, and, and being able to give the proper information and proper, uh, you know, uh, details to people, I think that that was, that was a bit tough initially. 
Um, but having said that, I think we, we you know, at Facebook we're, or at Meta, we, we start to roll out what we call the COVID information hubs. Um, so you not only have a mixture of sources which are international like WHO, uh, UNICEF and, and some of the others, but uh, also uh, local, uh, you know, credible, uh, you know, uh, health sources like your, your Department of Health uh, and other sub agencies under that. So those COVID information hubs, uh, you know, we have seen has, has been quite um, uh, positively used. You know, we've seen people sharing information from there uh, and going there to get the, the, the most up-to-date information. So, yeah, I think initially it was really just understanding who was right and who was wrong and what, what would be the right thing to do because, uh, there were mm. a bit of confusion, I, I guess, at the start, you know, what was the right treatments, what are the right things to do. Um, and, you know, we, 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 weren't, we didn't want to be the ones to kind of, you know, yeah. give out the wrong information. So, um, so I think that's, that's the initial challenges. And of course, ongoing challenges is just, you know, removing um, uh, false content, you know, misinformation and, and you know, anti-vaccine content. So yeah. we work closely with government agencies who report to us um, a lot of this kind of information. Uh, and, you know, we take down a lot of groups, a lot of pages, um, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah but I, uh, I, Professor uh, Gao and Bonkin, I bring this up also to, to, to ask you about, you know, part of the experience of, of trying to control information. So it's all well intended. But the reality is, you know, when we talk about regulating the platforms and trying to regulate content, we talked about that kind of worms. We talk about that slippery slope. And we know for a fact that there are governments and there are countries, right? Be careful what you wish for, because there are governments and there are countries that also use the veil and the cover of needing good information on COVID and the pandemic and vaccines to actually crack down on political dissent, to go after, you know, it's a slippery slope from spreading false information to going against government programs to cracking down on legitimate political uh, commentary. What are your thoughts? I and mean, what have we learned again in that side of uh, of our concerns about wanting the platforms and our content to be reliable and helpful, but at the same time balancing that with uh, press freedom, free expression, and so on. Okay, so in relation to COVID, I think COVID is easy to govern and regulate because there's clear cut science. At least, you know, in the past couple of months, I think uh, it's easier to label, you know, the authoritative sources, easier to crack down on anti-vaxxers. In fact, in the Philippines, I think they're a minority when they were having rallies, you know, in Manila. There are only a few people there. So it's not a lot in the Philippines. I think it's, it's you know, a bigger movement elsewhere. Uh, so I think, addressing COVID misinformation is easier because the science there and the, all, all of the stakeholders are, you know, hand-holding each other to, to address this. And political information is much more sophisticated and gray and doesn't have a clear cut, you know, um, you know what's wrong and what's right, right? So you're, you're right in your question. How do we protect freedom of expression at the same time, um, um, you know, uh, crack down on, on this information? So I think one of the things that we need to consider also is that most of, of the uh, things, this information we have in our ecosystem in the Philippines is in fact state-sponsored. I'm not going to you know, sugarcoat this anymore. Um, there's a study in, in Oxford University that in fact most of the coordinated authentic behavior are you know, propagated and promoted by governments, uh, covert operations in fact mm. under legitimate agencies and it's happening here. So I think that's one of the things that I'm thinking, how do you make them accountable for this? Especially in government, right? It's difficult mm. to make the government police itself. So I know we have sovereignty, international bodies can't really do this, but definitely it's a call for civil society as well um, to make sure that the government funds are not used and must be appropriated for the purposes of manipulating um, the people. Yeah, I have to mention, I imagine, um, this is not a question, I mean, com commentary here, but I imagine that you would also be conscious of opening this kind of worms, the timing has something to do with it. I, again, again, the main context of this discussion is that we're heading into national elections. I think the whole context of who wins in those elections, what's the ideology, what are the beliefs, what are the commitments of the, uh, anybody who wins will factor quite strongly in whether or not you wanna open that kind of worms now 
or in the future. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to add, Robbie, that sometimes it's not about ideological belief, really. Sometimes it's relational. So if you form mm. relationship from, you know, for example, Duterte communities on Facebook, since they've been Duterte fans ever since, you know, he won in 2016, it's difficult to disengage, right? So I think mm. more than, you know, I believe in certain things, it's because I believe in certain people. And it's part of our, you know, patronage personality politics in the Philippines. But definitely, the ecosystem of social media allows for these effective relationship to be formed between the populace and, and the candidates as well. Okay. I, I want to bring in some questions from, from our audience. This is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, anybody can answer. Do you think that the problem regarding information literacy is that educators or the academe do not call out directly that platforms uh, such as Facebook, YouTube, Google, um, and so on are the biggest sources of fake news, disinformation, and misinformation? Add to this the fact that some digital safety webinars are privacy washing events. So that's a question for us, right? For, yes, for, okay. so anyway, <laughs> okay. I'll go first. And, yeah, sure. And then Ben can follow since it's addressed to academics. So I think um, there's enough calling out um, in the platform, except that um, the conversation between platforms and academic, academics are not necessarily, you know, always happening. Um, of course, we recently connected with Facebook because we have this election research and we, we want to maintain that relationship to have that discussion as well. And I think that um ultimately uh it's not the voice of the academics that can reach a lot of people you know we can only reach certain circles of people and we need the help of civil society and you know our news um, practitioners to you know extend our reach and translate our research findings into something that could be understood by uh, by users right and if i may add in in one of our in a parent in a different event that we hosted um one of the one of our speakers there actually mentioned though, that there's a lack of, of you know demand or clamor from civil society and you know other as other sectors of society really for uh to to call out or to you know to engage social media platforms and even like to update the current laws that we have so they can you know um so they can cover you no know, more practices uh, related to disinformation in our contemporary landscape. Um, so really, um, I don't think it's just the academics' job <laughs> to call out because, as mentioned by Fabio, we've have we've had engagements, you no, know, with with uh, with platforms, but it really takes you non know, uh, a concerted effort, not just from academics but civil society, even from the public, you no, know, um, in in terms of you know improving the the information ecosystem. That's really where. Uh, platforms are playing a big role. Okay. Uh, again, from an anonymous attendee, this is for you, uh, Roy. Um, and this is actually a, a question that I wanted to get back to as well. Uh, first of all, uh, our anonymous attendee says, to be clear, social media also refers to platforms that are not controlled by big tech titans, such as those um, uh, Fediverse and self-hosted open source social media instances. As for Facebook, do you think they should collect less data than what is really needed and that they should not track their users even across websites that they visit? Comple and by the way, um, he or she adds, complex privacy settings are also not really that helpful. So, so yeah, I mean, like on the last point again, I think the, the privacy settings are not really that complex. And that's the reason why we have created this thing called privacy checkup. If you actually try to click through it, it's like a dummy's guide to, to your privacy on Facebook. It's just that, you know, um, people don't try it and maybe they don't know. So that's one. I, I think that's the thing. Um, right, 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 very quickly, I just want to interject there because yeah. I can hear the anonymous uh, attendee uh, wanting to, uh, well, I have to say, I tried it. Uh, there are pain points uh, there. Apart from the fact that, you know, again, I will plead my own, um, my own carelessness uh, notwithstanding knowing all of these things, my laziness can get the better of me, right? That's why. And also, it's not that it's that simple. I actually got lost um, in in playing around with those privacy settings, which kinds of ads do I want to see, and so on and so forth. There is there is some friction there. Well, I mean, look, if you want, at the end of the day, the privacy checkup, it's a step-by-step -step guide to go through the different settings. 
right? And if you want to, of course, dig deeper into your settings and, and check about, you know, the, the, the actual finer details, yes, it may take a bit of effort. But generally, the privacy setup uh, checkup is actually quite straightforward if you go step by step. Uh, and um, de definitely encourage everyone to just try it out. Um, let me ask you the question of, you know, I think what, as for Facebook, do you think we should collect, I guess, less data on what's really needed? Look, I, I don't, I don't think it's for me to really answer that. You know, I, I will, I will say why we collect data, right? And I think that this has been publicly, uh, you know, spoken about. I mean, at the end of the day, we are a free platform, and we use ads to help fund the platform, right? And um, and how you know how our ad system work is that you know with data, you know, we we can serve people the ads that they want to see, uh, and and businesses, you know, whether or not they're big businesses, small medium businesses, they're able to target the audience that they want to target. Um, and, uh, and so that's why, you know, we still continue to collect data. Uh, do we collect less data? I, you know, I think we, we, you know, ever since at least from, uh, Cambridge Analytica, I think we, we definitely have tightened up the data that we collect and, and the data that's available as well. So yes, you know, we, we can collect less data and, and we have done so. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, I think it's, it's, it's our business model in that sense, right? We do need data for you to be able to serve your ads. And um, so that, that will always be, I guess, part of it. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day also, you know, we do understand that not everyone wants all their data collected. And, and that's why there are, there are, you know, options on, on Facebook to delete your data, to clear a history uh, and, and that's available. And, um, and so that's, that's something I would definitely encourage people to, to find out more if, if they want to do that. Uh, good that you mentioned Cambridge Analytica because another uh, attendee is asking, have we learned our lessons there uh, and in what ways? And what are the concrete manifestations of us having learned from Cambridge Analytica to the, to the direction of making sure it never happens again? Yeah, look, so I, I, I would hope that we have learned, uh, you know, look, so ever since Cambridge Analytica, the way we, or the number of APIs and number of connections that we allow apps to connect to on our platform has been greatly reduced. I think if you speak to anyone who has been using applications or building applications connected to Facebook uh, for the longest time uh, before Cambridge Analytica, they, and, you know, they'll be able to tell you that you know, it's, it's night and day before and after. Right? Can, you put um, a, can you put a number to that just to give us a sense of how I mean, much that has improved? When you say that, for example, the number of APIs that no, no, allow it's, the apps to, it's a to number, plug in. Data not, not exactly a number, but the data yeah. that you can collect has been reduced, right? Mm. So things like, uh, you know, if you want to collect someone's phone number, you know, you need, you know, you need to be very, very clear what that that use is, and and needs to have, you know, all the, you know, the proper uh, kind of approvals from the person to do so before. Uh, and there are other some some other demographical data that we have just totally removed, right? Uh, and and so that's not available for people to kind of uh, uh, tap into anymore. Um, so. So I think concrete things like that, yes, it's, it's night and day. We don't allow people to tap into a lot of demographical data at all anymore. Uh, it's really just top line data that, that, um, that the user has to allow when using the app, when logging into the app. Um, but other than that, there's a lot of data that we, that we, have, we have kind of disconnected from the APIs. Hi, right, Professor Gao and, uh, and Bung Kin. That, that question, it's an interesting question. Uh, look, the, the tech platforms know a lot about us already. I think the basic question being asked, how much do they need to know? Uh, can you give us an idea of how much they already know and, uh, I mean, and how much ridiculously above that they actually still get to know about us, whether or not they allow third parties to tap into that? Mm, I think data only has value if it's historically curated. So with their knowledge base now and with the continuous collection of data, even if it's less, it's still valuable. It's still, you know, a lot of things known about us. But the thing is, it's one question to know how many, you know, data points they collect about us. Another question of how they use that data, right? Who they sell it to, for what purposes. Um, and in fact, I think, I'm not sure if in GDPR, in the uh, uh, data privacy regulation in the EU, um, they've already allowed for users to ask for the platforms, hey, what do you know about me? Okay, actually, I call for everyone to request the, the platforms. If you want to request your data, they, can, they, they should be able to give you that. 
Um, I mean, you can request actually to have those data removed from the platform. That's your right as a citizen, thanks to the EU. Okay, not, ko lang, ko lang. Yeah. You're saying we can do that right now? Yeah, you can request to the platforms how much How do I do that? How do I... How do I do uh, that, for example? So that's, that's do, what, I, that's what I mean. You can, you can go and clear your history and clear your data in the, on the platform. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, you can. There's just Google, I guess, how, how you would want to delete that. Um, I've done that for Netflix, a separate platform for my research. You can request your you know, viewing history. Um, similarly, for other platforms, you can do the same. So if you want you know, to erase... Um, data about you uh, the, the, it's called actually and uh, the right to forget i think is the right term for that mm-hmm. if you want to be forgotten online and to erase your footprint you can do that so there's that extent but the thing is yes you can do that but it, it takes some time i think there's a turnaround time of 30 to 45 days before they can give you that data so um there's those mechanisms in place uh, but i think it's being transparent again how 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 um the data is used ultimately um in forms that are accessible to us not not in complex you know documents so it's important to always um, communicate that mm. hey professor because roy does keep reminding us look you can control your data you can erase your data you can opt out um, you can choose not to opt in um, and so on and so forth but professor Bonkin, for the for the typical filipino for the typical citizen when they're reminded of that do they have the mindset of you know, I need this too because I need to protect my privacy, because I need to protect my integrity, or is it just a matter of um, the best user experience that I can have? You're on mute, I think, if you're still there, Professor Bunkin. Okay. Yeah, maybe for, yes. both of you, for, for, for you, Roy, and for, for Grace, I, I'm trying to get into the mindset and just being honest here. Even when you say pe- to tell people, you can opt out and so on. The reality is most people are probably looking at that as a user experience uh, matter. Uh, not necessarily for most people, I would imagine, they're not necessarily looking at it in terms of protecting myself as a citizen. Well, I guess, you know, with, with user experience, um, you know, there is a trade-off, right? If you, if you mm-hmm. want Facebook to serve you the things that you want to see, then, of course, we need data in order to do that, uh, your search history and all that. But if you if you don't want us to, if you don't want your search history to be on our platforms, then then the user experience drops. So, you know, it's a catch twenty two. Like uh, we can't we can't serve you what you want to know without data. Um, I mean, there's there's no other way to do that. I guess, yeah. Hmm. Professor Gao, you you have any thoughts on that? Sure. Uh... I think the feeling of users are ambivalent. You know, there's that, that mm. uh, sorry, in, in English, uh, Roy is correct. You know, that the user experience that suffers. If we are to follow what Facebook is saying, that more data is a better user experience. At the same time, they are not happy sharing a lot of information, but they have to. Mm. So it's really the default, the default way of doing things um, because, you know, there's a call to delete Facebook, you know, a few years back and it's been... Oh, naka, okay. we lost your audio for a while. Okay. Hello. Okay. You're yeah. Back. Okay. So I, I was saying that everyone's on Facebook. Um, your teachers are there. Your parents. For you to reach, you know, particular services of the government, you have to, you know, message them on Facebook. There's a lot of things you will miss out if you opt out of Facebook. So there's that ambivalence. I have to be there. I have to share my data because I need to be able to function every day because all the services, all the you know, the connections I need are in the platform. So uh, I, I heed the call in, in of several U.S. senators that perhaps it's time to break up big tech. And I really believe that it's time to break up their power because if economically they're not as big, perhaps we have more diversity in, you know, whoever else platform can um, can enter the market and, and be another space for discursive um, uh, discussions. Okay, another question from another anonymous attendee. Uh, can the Philippine government hold uh, tech titans accountable uh, in the form of fines in the same way that it's happening in other countries? I want to expand that maybe the Kaki uh, Batnon is a question also, you know, without talking into how we get into regulation, assuming that there's some regulations um, that, we're, that can actually strike a balance. But what will, fine, what will penalties look like that will be, that will be meaningful?
sorry, I can answer, but very short. Um, I think we have to determine first which is which violations they will commit before they are penalized. And first defining that before we ask any penalties. Yeah, That's my yeah. answer. I, and, and to that point also, I, I don't bring it there. Do you think we should be, are we ready to even talk about regulation when, as, as we all also acknowledge, there's a lot of education that has to happen at the, citizen, at the level of citizens and users anyway, uh, still? Uh, maybe I can also, maybe a short answer to that. No? In terms of regulation, right now, given their current political climate, maybe not yet. Um, mm. We need to first, of course, have a, a government that we trust no? <laughs> and then when it comes to re, re, who will be regulating our social media platforms. Mm. Our, mm. I guess our best bet right now is to have like you know an independent watchdog that can serve as that regulatory body. The government itself, um, given our current political climate, given you know our experience when it comes to you know um, uh, freedom of expression, and um, I think it has to still be you know reconsidered or maybe you know postponed to, <laughs> to a different yeah. time frame. What, what what does that look like, I, I professors? Uh, in your mind, right? and we're just playing around here. But when you think of an independent body, a multi-sectoral, all of society representation. What exactly does that look like uh, in terms of uh, a starting point that we can that we can trust? Very hard question, Rob. <laughs> um, of of imagining that kind of uh, organization. Um, mm. I think there are existing organizations that already engage with that kind of uh, in that space of of regulating big tech. Um, ex except that you know they're individual organizations. They're not you know. In, in, mm. you're, they're not coordinating in one large organization. I think there's that. Um, but definitely, it's going to be a multi-sectoral approach. I think, you know, in, in the hierarchy of things, the Philippines has more, I don't know, a, a more, has, has a more, has more bigger problems, right? Um, and, and, and I observe in, you know, in, in the debates of the presidential balls and vice presidential balls and authority balls, Platform regulation is not talked about. Oftentimes, it's only talked about the problem that they debate about is this information. But the level to which they engage it is just, you know, a very shallow level. So I think we need to make it a public agenda first before we can even, you know, engage people, invite stakeholders to form this group or watchdog organization that could really be an independent body. But I, I know Ben's answer is, you know, we're not ready. But hopefully, if, you know, the Senate, anyway, if the Senate, you know, has, has they have proponents in the Senate who can forward this and institutionalize measures to govern big tech, perhaps that's a good first step. And we know how long certain laws pass um, in the Philippines. Maybe start now, baby steps, and see if we can actually reach, you know, uh, approval or a third reading for that bill. Okay. Okay, so I want to go back to one basic question that, that we have, and later on, makikita natin sentiment ng mga tao. Um, Roy, uh, Professor Gao, Professor Bongking, do platforms affect how we vote? Do they, that, do they have that power over us at this point? Um, maybe I can answer. Um, my answer that is not, not directly. It's not as if the platforms will tell you who to vote for, but it's really the mechanisms within the platform that shape you know our our decisions um, um i mentioned earlier that there's some sort of control happening at the platform level because it's really the platform that's you know and their algorithms and their you know the the, the structure that they put in place to facilitate all of the information that we are getting on, on social media um you know our feeds are what we call they're they're curated algorithmically so it learns from our interactions um so you know, um, and at the same time, you know, you have these tech companies, the big tech that can control these algorithms. So in other words, they can definitely shape, you know, our understanding and the kind of information that reaches to us. Um, and, you know, um, other players, you no, know, so people not directly within the, uh, not people who don't work for the platform, but are in the platform, you no, know, they can strategically use the platform. So in a way, I guess, um, it, that influences, you know, or the way we, we vote for. Um, so it, it, it can provide again what I mentioned earlier that that illusion you know, of of uh, of grandness, you know, the the, the, the uh, can manufacture you know, popularity, can manufacture you know all of these um, messages that can influence our decision come election time. So it's not direct, but you know the mechanisms within the space and the the kinds of uh, realities that are formed within the platform are shaped you know, or help us decide you know, who to vote for. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, J- just to add, so platforms don't have ideological power that we know. You know, there's, there's the church, there's the education system, the government, um, who tells us what's wrong or right. Um, what platforms have is what we call logistical power. To be able to organize things we see. Some things, you know, perhaps, you know, two candidates are sharing their campaign materials, but not is uh, but but they're not equally given visibility in the platform. So that's 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 the governance mechanism of the platform. Some things are more visible than others, some things are more salient. In fact, um and and, and there's also another qualifier there, more salient where in which community. So I think we have to think about um, platforms power as organizing our discourse more than you know telling us what to talk about. Um so kind of you know agenda setting, but of, of course contextualized to particular communities, to particular spaces in the platform. So I think that's what we need to realize. Uh, uh, and, and then what, what exactly Professor Munkin said, you know, some, plat- some, some actors, malign actors, are actually gaming um, um, the platform affordances mm. and logics to be able to be more visible, to be able to be recommended um, in the platform. So there's that complicity between the platform affordances that are exploited at the same time, uh, the, the actors uh, with, with malign ends to, to game the system. Roy, how does how does Facebook uh, uh, approach this this question in the context also of you know with great um, with great power comes great responsibility? Do the platforms proceed from that premise that the reality is that we have great power to influence how people will behave and vote? Well, you know, I I, I don't think. You know, I think all the work that we're doing for elections, all the work that that you know I mentioned. Uh, and me being here chatting to you right now um, shows that, you know, yeah, I think, you know, that to an extent that, that, you know, we do have an influence, we do have a part to play. Uh, and so, you know, we do want to make sure that uh, uh, that we can help, you know, mitigate issues and work on issues together. Uh, you know, but, uh, you know, but I remember as well, like, uh, you know, when you, when you think about the greater issues and the greater problems of why people follow political stakeholders anywhere, um, I remember seeing a study that said something like um, believing false information is like a symptom of the problem, uh, not the problem itself, right? Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and, and so what, what, is that, what is that problem or what is that symptom? Like why, why is it festering and why are people, you know, uh, you know, happy to be in echo chambers and not open to other interpretations? Mm-hmm. And other, you know? mm-hmm. So I think... Those are questions as well, I guess, um, that, that's important to ask. Um, but I think the things that we're doing on digital literacy, at least to me, I think it's very important, right? Because I do know, even my own personal friends, I do know folks which are just very fervent in supporting one side of the house and they don't really know how to, you know, check the sources of information, everything they see, as long as it's beating the opposition in that sense, they believe it. And I think it's important, you know, and it's multi-sectoral, it's not just what we can do, but can the government do more? Can NGOs and CSOs do more? To kind of promote, you know, the whole culture of, of checking, thinking before you share, checking your sources. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think it also comes down to, uh, it could be a generational change, I don't know, because. I mean, you, you, you take away Meta, you take away Facebook and Instagram, the same thing's happening in, in any media. You know, in America, you've got Fox News, you've got CNN, right? You know, like I, for me now, when I watch CNN, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, you know, I know they are leading a certain way. Maybe I should just double check my sources. And similarly, Fox News, right? It's, it's for a certain uh, 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 group of people in the US, it's the same thing. So it's, you don't just see it, you know, on social media, but you see it on news media, you see it in, in, in different parts. And even in the Philippines, you know, you got Rappler on one side and you got, a, you know, other, other media on the other mm-hmm. side, right? So it's not just about social media, but it's also, I think it's, what is the real issue at hand? I, I, I can't put my, yeah. you know, my, my, my hand into it, but I think there's a larger kind of discussion that needs to be had yeah. uh, as well, yeah. I, but the fact, I, but the fact that we are doing things, the fact that we're here, yeah. you know, I think we, we, we acknowledge that we have a part to play. Yeah, and we certainly we certainly approach appreciate yeah. Meta and Facebook being represented here. I uh, really appreciate all your uh, sharings and thoughts um, and, and candidness, uh, Roy. Uh, but I want to bring back because I will put my hand on something, uh, and I think we've touched on that. Obviously, education 
is uh, you know obviously uh, uh, everything you were discussing is, is also a symptom of, of I agree a bigger problem than the platforms because we've had that problem far longer than than we've had uh, even the internet and that's really education in the Philippines. I, I um, uh, Professor Gao and Professor Bonkin, what should a digital literacy or information literacy program look like? Is, are there any improvements there? What are you seeing and what else do we need to do? Uh, I have to admit, I'm not very knowledgeable of exactly how I, our media literacy programs are rolled out. But what I've heard is that what they do is assign computer, computer specialists or computer science teachers to teach uh, media literacy. And it's not the case. What, what's being taught is you know, how to use Facebook, how to open an account. It's not the you know, critical skills that we need to be mm. able to discern information. They're teaching the technical skill, skills to use technology, but not how to you know, spot uh, information that might be dubious. So I think we need to step out, step up on that aspect of the critical skills more than the technical skills. It goes hand in hand. Definitely a knowledge of, of, of the tech technology is good. But at the same time, it's the information that's also um, that needs to be judged accordingly. And I think one of the things that we must be promoted, and I'm, I'm an advocate of this, we need to rebuild trust in media because yes. ultimately, if we are do not trust our media institutions, you will seek alternative sources of information that not that might be vet, not be vetted or you know uh, are, are launched by by political actors with with um, political interests other than the public interest. Right. For me, it's uh, a good media literacy program. Really highlights, you know, critical thinking. It's at the forefront you know, of the of the curriculum. You know? So it's um, inculcating skills need, needed by students to really be able, to, you know, to dissect all of the content that they see online. Even if they're not trained fact checkers, they know how to verify sources. They know how to, you know, triangulate or validate. You no. Know? Uh, so it's how really early for, does that for start? Young. How early does that start? I think it starts at a very young age, not just you know, um, not just at the senior high school or junior high school level. Um, um, at the young age, we should, you know, I think it, it at a certain extent it can be cultural, you no, know? but you know, learning to question, you know, um, authorities is is, is uh, I guess one of the one one step. You no, know? it's that ability to you know to question everything that's being uh, and not just blindly obeying. You no, know? so those things begin at very early. Stage. Uh, very early age, no, not just uh, at the senior high school level. So, in terms of media literacy, really, um, it's contextualizing that critical thinking in, you know, in the way we engage in the uh, in the current information ecosystem. Um, so, right now, as mentioned by Fatima, the way, we, at least the ones we know, no, parang they, they focus on the more creative use of platforms, not much on the cri cri uh, critical use of it. So. Um, I think that's that aspect needs to be beefed up. Yeah, uh, Roy um, and Fatima and Benedict pointed out I mean, something very close to my heart. I'll admit it. There's a, a professional and personal bias to it, but I do subscribe to it as well. It's also this this matter as well of of really bringing back um, and backing up the the need for media that we can believe. That can backstop. That can be, and, and there's a gray area there as well. I, I acknowledge, but just in terms of however you would define credible, uh, independent media organizations, what are the platforms doing to actively support that? Not just in terms of supporting their fact-checking skills, but really as part of the media and information literacy campaigns to tell people that this is part. This is part of critical skills and critical thinking that ultimately you need sources that you can trust. You're talking about what we're doing for news media on the platform, right? Um, yeah, look, there are a few things. Uh, our, we have a news partnerships team which just works uh, specifically on, on, news, uh, on news partners. Um, it, it supports the publishers, the digital literacy, the training, upskilling of how to use the platforms. So that's one, one part. Um, but you know, we also look at original and authoritative uh, you know, news sources on our platforms, right? So we have things like news labeling. So it's in certain countries, we, we, you know, there are certain news that are labeled as state media, 
uh, you know, we want to be clear who they are. Um, and even if authoritative news sources, you, we, you know, we give more information about who they are, like, you know, like CNN, you know, uh, you know we give some background about who they are and making sure it's author uh, authoritative. Um, and, uh, you know, and we also want to be informative about, about news that, that's being shared, right? So we also, you know, nudge people, for example, if, if you are trying to share, uh, you know, certain articles which have been fact-checked and, and things like that, you know, we're, we're just very clear that, hey, uh, this article may have an issue with it. Uh, you may want to read another article from the authoritative source. Um, so that's the informative um, kind of uh, aspect. As well as, you know, we try to reduce um, a lot of clickbaity content on the platform. So, mm -hmm. there, you know, like the sensationalist news organizations love to use headlines like, hey, did you know? Have you seen? You know, things mm -hmm. like that. And um, all that kind of feeds into, uh, you know, what we call clickbait content. And we yeah. reduce that on the platform. So we want to be, you know, accurate about how we prioritize news sources as well. So, so yeah, so there is whole facet of, of things that we do uh, with supporting news quality uh, on the platform. Um, but we do work with, with news publishers to ensure that uh, they have the best kind of uh, uh, setup ready to ensure that uh, you know, they, they are authoritative on the platform. So I think that's, that's, that's quite key for, for what we do. Um, and of course, at the end of the day, uh, these news sources, depending on your persuasion, mm. may of course uh, be one-sided if, if, if you feel a certain way. But, but yes, we, we do try to ensure that they all have a voice to play, a part to play. Okay, comment from an anonymous attendee, but a teacher, uh, he or she makes that clear. As a teacher, I do not encourage my current and future students to create and use Facebook. Why? Because it's possible to live and still have access to credible news without Facebook. Comment from one of our users, if, if anybody would care to, to react. So I think, I, I mean, I would just mention that as we know young, young kids, right? No matter what you tell them, they will do it if they want to. So whether or not it's Facebook, whether or not it's Instagram. So I think it goes down to what, how can the teacher teach the right things to the kids, mm -hmm. right? If you want to use the platform, right? Are you of the right age? What should you be looking out? Things like cyberbullying is a big thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we are concerned about that, uh, especially with youths. And I think it's, it's not about telling them you don't need to use it because yes, you don't need to, but you know, they're going to use it. So can you educate them ahead of time before they use it? And, and that's what I mean, going back, especially with, with, with young, young children, I have young kids as well, and I educate them, you know, you need, you need to know how to switch off, right? If this, give them scenarios, give them, give them different kind of uh, uh, thought processes uh, and situational uh, uh, ideas. And these are things that, you know, um, from Meta's perspective, we can actually help. And that's why we have worked with, uh, uh, you know, did that to kind of promote some of these resources. So if there are folks listening on that, that are playing in this space, you know, definitely don't hesitate to reach out because we do have resources that we can give you, you can just run with it and educate, you know, the youths um, in a much better way. Okay, we're running out of time. I know people have to get to, to their class uh, as well, not just the people here, but also the people. But I do want to uh, put in one quick question as well to uh, Professor Gao and Professor uh, Bunkin, because of course, we're not just talking about Facebook. I'm particularly interested in TikTok. We talk about the power of algorithms and with TikTok, I, for example, from what I understand, because I will plead I am not on TikTok, I've installed it five times, I've uninstalled it five times because I just get intimidated by the fact that what's happening, I, I don't know what's going on, what's the control here, and that it's constantly just feeding me, learning about me, feeding me, more talk about the impact of these new platforms on our elections. Um, first of all, as researchers, um, it's difficult for us to study TikTok because it's not the, the information or data from TikTok is not something we can access through the tools we have right now. So on, on the level of tools, at least Facebook has crowd dangle in terms of you know collecting um, data. So we can you will be able to study it. TikTok doesn't have that yet. If we want to collect data from TikTok, we need to do it manually and, you know, um, do manual collection of data, screenshots and whatnot. Um, so there's that. Secondly, definitely TikTok is a growing platform in the Philippines and globally. Um, um, I think we just have to remember that TikTok is a Chinese-owned company. 
to begin with, and that there are historical censorship um, issues uh, with TikTok as well, especially when it comes to you know hot button issues for China like Uyghur Muslims and whatnot. In terms of the election, definitely it's a space where this information can really spread without any checks and balances because the algorithm there is very personal. Whatever you consume, it's harder to know um, if other people um, do have access uh, or are seeing the same content you're seeing. So um, in terms of the platform being transparent of how it works, it's, it's quite difficult to answer now. Okay. So I don't know, uh, there are no, I, I don't think there are existing tools yet that can help us study TikTok. Um, although I think there are some that have began, you know, um, enabling researchers to study the platform. Right now, we haven't, you know, really tapped into them yet. Um, but I think the platform itself prioritizes, you know, virality, you know, <laughs> as opposed to other types of engagement, which is why it's easy to go viral on TikTok, no? So definitely that's, uh, that, that uh, or making use of that, that, that culture within TikTok as a platform where you can go viral is something that political communicators or campaign specialists would want to tap into. Um, and there's also a certain culture within the platform, no, yung, yung infotainment kind of content or sort of educational type of content that really something that you know, hits hard in the TikTok audiences. No, those are again some facets with it, or those are platform specific, you know, cultures um, and vernaculars that are uh, that can be taken advantage of no, by, by political communicators. But again, so long as we don't have it's really difficult for us to study it in a more empirical manner because <laughs> we don't have access to the to the data yet. But yeah. Okay. Uh, maraming salamat. We only have a few minutes left. I'd like to invite our panelists, uh, Roy, Fatima, Benedict, uh, to give us a very short parting word. Well, my, oh, my only parting word is that uh, whatever uh, conversation we're having right now, maybe it's quite late already in terms of the election period, because it's only a few days, actually, uh, before May 9. So if we are taking in lessons today, perhaps it's something we need to work on post-election and to be able to you know, act on the things we've spotted and the issues we want to address for the next election uh, for the midterm one. Uh, for me, I'm looking at it from a network perspective. You know, there's always this notion that networks influence the way we behave, but at the same time, we don't realize that um, individuals in a network can configure their networks. No, So there's really still the power of the individual that can shape whatever information they want to receive and you know what kind of conversations they want to engage in. So it's really highlighting the role of the individual and their agency in all of these, you know, um, in this information ecosystem. You, you can choose actually to get out of your eco chamber, you know, and the platform it allows you to do that. You can choose to, uh, you know, to, to choose, uh, you can choose the more um, you know legitimate and authentic sources of information. You no, know, but it really takes that you know consciousness and um, for uh, for individuals to to be able to, to realize that. You no. Know. Right. Yeah, I think. Look, um, at the end of the day, I think the, the conversation doesn't just stop here. Um, you know, I think at Meta, we we continue to want to be engaged uh, with all different kinds of stakeholders. Uh, but also, I'd just like to say that you know I've I've been involved and engaged in the in the Philippines uh, for the past five years, and um, you know I know there are a lot of passionate people, both Filipinos and uh, you know folks in Singapore, folks in the U.S. that are doing their best and uh, engaging in the in the work uh, for the Philippines, uh, whether or not it's elections or or even past that. So um, yeah, just want to kind of put it out there. But thank you for the opportunity to, to, to speak to everyone and be engaged. Yeah, and we certainly appreciate it. Uh, and to our Zoom attendees, I mean, to show your appreciation as well, we'd ask you to take a moment to answer a quick poll of just five questions to show our panel as well, our appreciation for your time that's being flashed on your screen. If you're watching over YouTube and Facebook, don't mind what I'm saying. Uh, you won't be seeing this, uh, this, this, uh, this poll, online poll. This is for people already in our in our uh, who are registered within our Zoom uh, webinar, but by all means, if you want to leave your comments, suggestions, uh, and still your questions, please do so in the comment section on Facebook or on YouTube, and we will appreciate the feedback. Um, and uh, while you're answering, again, we'd like to thank very much all our speakers. I know this is a very uh, hectic season for all of you. We appreciate that you've shared your wisdom in our webinar today, Professor John Benedict Bunkin, Professor Marie Fatima Gao, and of course, Roy Tan 
of Meta. Maraming maraming salamat sa inyo. Now, in the meantime, as we mentioned earlier, we're also launching our post test so you can assess your progress in knowledge and understanding. We actually would like to see how your sentiments have changed. So if you go to Mentimeter, again, the original question, anong kapangyarihan ng tech giants sa election? We're facing, we're showing here the new word cloud, an updated word cloud, and this might be so good for insights on if anything you've noticed has changed in your answer, in our collective answers, and so on. We will keep the post test open in the background as we proceed with our program. Uh, and again, that question, my uh, influence, the overwhelming answer seems to be yes. Uh, but now it's my distinct pleasure uh, to introduce to you, as I thank you also for having me in this program, I'd like to introduce the immediate past president of the Philippines Communication Society. Please welcome Professor Christine Virai. Hello, uh, thank you, Robbie. And thank you to our speakers for a very insightful discussion on the role of this tech giants this coming election and actually so in, in our lives. Okay, since I'm tasked to give the, the synthesis for this webinar, I will just mention some key takeaways that I noted during the discussion. Well, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, these are three of the popular tech giants that are said to be in control of the digital world. They've also been identified as major sources of fake news, troll farms, information manipulation, and controlled narratives. Props Gao and Bunkin reminded us that these tech giants are, after all, business entities, and it is but natural for them to forward the interests of their companies. Roy suggests that people should take a step back and look at the platforms in a bigger picture, having diverse users with diverse interests and culture. Robbie threw an interesting question about how much the platform knows us better than we do. This may have something to do with the algorithmic analysis done by the platforms. But this may all be because of the issue of commercialization. Your inputs actually provides the platform an idea of what you need or want. Thus, most of the content you see seem to be a reflection of your personality. Robbie asked a question on platforms responsibility to protect the users. And Roy talked about digital literacy and engagement where civic education on the use of digital platforms are shared. The speakers believe that little by little, there are things being done by some tech giants to address the issue of responsibility. In terms of protecting the integrity of election, transparency in ads is what Meta has been doing in every election. John thinks that political comm managers who know how algorithm works can make use of the platforms to their advantage, even to the point of manipulating them. We also heard terms such as algorithmic breaks, algorithmic incentivizing from, Pat from Fatima, which somehow help us better understand how algorithm is used by the platforms. I agree with the idea that it should not be about control of content anymore, but the control of actors. There is a need to police those actors who are paid to do false and malicious content. Fatima believes that most of the misinformation are state-sponsored. So sad. <laughs> so the question of how we are going to deal with misinformation when the very institution we rely on truthful information is the cultivator of misinformation. John believes that the need to improve the eco info ecosystem is not just about uh, it's not just a, a job for the academe, but it's a job for the whole society. At the end of the day, as mentioned by Roy, platforms exist through ads. So your use of any platform for free somehow give these ads an access to your information. Though there are privacy settings designed to protect your data, still, basic info about oneself can be used by these ads for their interests. Are we ready to regulate our social media platforms? Well, John believes that we are not. We need to have a complete trust with our government first before we think of regulating the social media. All our speakers believe that there's a need to step up on the media and information literacy education of the Filipinos. The education must start from a very young age to develop critical thinking skills. 
news partnerships, news labeling, and reduction of clickbaits are some of the things Meta do in supporting news media. Fatima mentioned about platforms having no ideological powers and what they have is logistical power. They organize our discourse. We should understand this to be able to see that the choice is still ours. We just need to be more critical of what we consume from these platforms. In conclusion, I believe that we cannot undermine the power of these tech titans to influence not just our decision to vote for this election, but as well as how we live our lives. It is therefore important for us to keep being cautious and prudent on what information to consume and what information to disregard. Though we wish for these technology giants to be responsible to what they share and communicate, it is still our responsibility to ourselves to make better judgment of the information we receive. Again, thank you to all our speakers, Mr. Tan, Ms. Gao, and Mr. Bunkin, to our participants, to our moderator, Robbie, and to all organizers of this event. We hope to see you on our next webinar. Keep safe, everyone. Thank you, Professor Christine Virai. Uh, that pretty much captures everything. And now, just to round out our program, we're sharing the post-test results for our viewers. Um, this is uh, what you shared. You can compare that to how uh, our group and you individually answered at the start of this program. As you can see from your screens, there are differences. There also, hopefully, is a representation of an increase in knowledge and understanding of the issues based on the post-test results. Those who have actively participated will get the most out of this interactive program. As mentioned, this webinar is part of a series of the National Forum on Communication and Democracy, Philippine Elections 2022. PCS will be having a webinar every second Wednesday puto of the month until May 2022. So please mark your calendars every second Wednesday of the month until May 2022. Next month, we'll be featuring Citizens Vote Watch with Malu Mangahas as your host and moderator. Please stay tuned for updates in the PCS website or Facebook page. If you'd like to watch this or all other previous webinars in playback, or if you would like to share this with your friends, all webinars in this series are available for viewing at your convenience at the TVUP YouTube channel. Okay, so this formally closes the eighth National Forum on Communication and Democracy, Philippine Elections 2022. We look forward to your company again every second Wednesday of the month from 12 noon to 2 p.m. Manil time. So same time as we had today. Ako po si Robby Alampay from TV5, Signal TV, and Puma Podcast on behalf of the Philippine Communication Society that strengthened our country's democratic foundations through communication Enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of your week. Maraming sarapat po.